So yeah, anyway, we're going to be talking about how you can punitize your app using Polymer. But before I go into this discussion, I want to start off by talking about Jam. And um, the story I'm going to tell you, I feel like, sort of parallels our own lives in an interesting way. Uh, a few years ago, this group of cognitive scientists did this experiment where they took a group of people to a supermarket and they gave them all a bunch of coupons so that they could buy uh, various things in the supermarket. One of those coupons was for jars of jam. And the first group of people that they took to the store, they showed them this display with six jars of jam in it. And they could go, they could like taste the jars of jam or whatever. And then they were free to go off in the rest of the store and, and do their shopping. Uh, the, the second group of people that they took to the store, rather than showing them just six jars of jam, they showed them this much more ostentatious display with like 24 jars of jam in it. And they found that people spent a lot more time at the display and they tasted more jars of jam and generally it seemed like they liked it a lot more. But when it came time to make a purchase, they found that the group of people that only looked at six jars of jam, about 30% of them ended up buying a jar of jam. And the group of people that looked at 24 jars of jam, only about 3% of them ended up buying a jar of jam. So it's like a 10x difference there. And the reason why I tell you this story is because I feel like as a front-end developer, I'm like those people looking at 24 jars of jam anytime I start some new project. And my buddy Addy uh, wrote this blog post recently, and in that blog post he said, when you're presented with like an abundance of choice, it can be really difficult to, to feel like the choice that you're making is, is the right one. And Addy did not write this uh, about jam. Uh, Addy wrote this in this piece called Front-end Choice Paralysis looking at all the different frameworks and libraries and tools that are out there today that you know, anytime you start a new project, you've got this whole tree of decisions that you have to deal with. So I did some like Google Trends research, if you will, recently, and I just started looking at all the different front-end MVCs that are out there. So Angular, React, Ember, Knockout, and this is like developer interest, or this is people Googling these things over time. And it's really interesting because you can see that there's like this natural bell curve, there's kind of like an ebb and flow to these things. And from this perspective, web development looks pretty crazy, right? Like there's a lot of things to choose from and, and as a developer, I wanna make sure that you know, the thing that I choose is, is on the up and not, not, not on that downslope or anything like that. Um, and so it's really scary for developers. And one of the things that all these frameworks have in common is this notion of components, which are these little widgets that you can reuse throughout your application. Well, the problem here is that they're all different. And so if I make a really cool component in Ember, I can't use that in my React app. I can't use that in my Angular app or vice versa. And that's kind of a bummer because developing for the web is fundamentally just like hard enough as it is without being locked into any one particular silo. So this is where this idea of web components really comes in. And with web components, the hope here is that you can build a component and then use it in any context regardless of the framework or library that's powering the entire application. So you no longer have to choose between rolling your UI entirely by yourself or being locked into some silo. So where does Polymer fit in with all this? Well, Polymer is just a library for building web components. So it adds features that makes it a little bit faster and a little bit easier to make these components. But one thing that we really try to stress is that Polymer is not a framework. The very premise of web components is that they are not a framework. And Polymer is not trying to like, replace another framework or anything like that. Really the goal is just to help people build components that they can then use with their framework so it can kind of orchestrate the whole application. So if this is the world that we live in today where we've got the web platform on the bottom, sort of existing frameworks sitting on top and that's what we build our apps out of, the place where we wanna be is where we actually use web components on top of the web platform as the, sort of the building blocks that our frameworks leverage. And those web components could be built with Polymer, they could be built with vanilla JavaScript, or they could be built with other libraries like Xtags. And the nice thing about web components is that because they're interoperable, and because they don't really care what the other are built with, you can leverage them regardless of the framework that you're using. So a few years ago, um, we really started Polymer as like an experiment, just to see if we could get people to try out that model that I was just showing you there. Um, and it began as a series of polyfills, and it kind of grew over time because we realized that the web components features, they're really powerful, but they're also very low level. So it takes a fair bit of code to create a component. So we just tried to sugar that experience a little bit and make it easier for you to build things, uh, build these components. Now what we found during this process was that developers had certain things that they really, really liked about building components with Polymer. They thought that the data binding system was pretty cool, right? It makes it very handy to be able to bind inside of a component, cuts down a ton of boilerplate JavaScript, 
They like that they could reuse other people's components. So they could just grab any component off the shelf and mash it into their application. And they also found it really easy to get started. Because when you're focused just on building a single component, right, you don't have to know about an entire framework's like world view of how your application should work. You're just focusing on this one scope thing, a little bit of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. But they had some dislikes as well, and they were very vocal about these, um, especially on Twitter. And uh, some of the issues that they cited was that you know, there's some weird cross-browser quirkiness that goes on with web components because they're not native everywhere. So you'd have a component that worked really good in Chrome, and then you try it out in Safari or Firefox, and it just wouldn't act the same. The other issue was that the polyfills could be really slow. In particular, the Shadow DOM polyfill could just be kind of like you know, ruining your performance. And lastly, they said that theming was really hard. So Shadow DOM is this really cool concept. It lets you scope your CSS to your components and protect it from document level CSS, which is awesome if you're a component author. But that's sort of a double-edged sword, too, because if I take someone's component, I want to apply my own branding to it, then I have to resort to using weird shadow-piercing CSS selectors and combinators. So a few issues there that they, they brought up with us. And, and this is really like where we were about a year ago. We had version Polymer 05, and there was a lot of promise to this library, but it just like wasn't quite living up to developer expectations, right? We had these rough edges that we had to work out. Um, and that's okay, because it's an experiment, right? And like you learn things when you experiment, and you iterate, and you make changes. And there were a lot of people that said, you know, we, we get that it's an experiment, but we want this to be a production-ready thing. We want to be able to ship this. So we built this little benchmark, and this is for a medium complexity application. It has like a few hundred Polymer elements on it, and this is measuring startup time. And so you can see that in desktop Chrome and uh, desktop Safari, that startup time is like, it's okay. You know, it's doing okay. But as soon as you hit mobile Safari and desktop Firefox, it just was like shot through the roof, right? People said, you know, this is unacceptable. So we used this as kind of like a guiding light to see if we could improve upon things. And, you know, we hit the gym, we did a montage, we like punched some slabs of beef, and we basically rewrote the library from scratch, focusing on these performance bottlenecks. And around version 08, we were able to get performance, you know, drastically better. So like five times faster in mobile Safari, uh, eight times faster in desktop Firefox. The, the thing that I think is really cool here, though, is that we got four times faster in Chrome. And that's cool because Chrome already ships native web components. So we got faster there, which means as mobile Safari and desktop Firefox begin to implement web component standards, we'll continue to get faster there as well, which I think is pretty neat. Uh, we were also able to cut down the file size of the library by about a third. So it's about 42K now, gzipped, uh, but this includes all of the polyfills, and you can always conditionally load those polyfills, and if you're using like the lightest weight version of Polymer, you can actually get this down to about 19K. So at this point, we're feeling like Polymer is 1.0. We feel like it's ready for production. We want people to start building things with it, and within Google, a bunch of teams have started building really big projects using it. Um, but rather than just like talk about it, let me actually show you what it looks like to build something in Polymer 1.0. Uh, after that, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we knit these things into applications, and then I'm going to show you uh, some interesting experiments with doing Polymer 1.0 and Angular 2. Uh, so this is what I'm going to build today. It's like the world's most boring component. It's just a little banner that you would like display to the user as like a success notification. Uh, but it's a useful tutorial of like what it looks like to actually build a real component. So anytime you're creating any component, you always want to start off with an HTML file, and that's going to hold your component's definition. So inside of here, I've just got uh, an HTML file which I've called quickalert.html. And the first thing I'm going to do is import the definition for Polymer using an HTML import. And that's one of the web component standards that we've been working on. So you can think of this the same way that you like, load a library like jQuery before you register a jQuery plugin, or you import something in ES6, right? I've got to make sure that Polymer is, is loaded into the document before I can work with it. And the cool thing about HTML imports is that they naturally deduplicate. So if you have multiple elements all importing the same resource, like Polymer in this case, it will only be loaded one time, which is really nice. Now with that in place, I'm actually ready to call the Polymer constructor. And I call it, I pass it an object literal, which is going to serve as my element's prototype. And I give it a little is property, which is going to be the name of my element that actually gets registered in the document. So with just this little bit of code here, I've created a new tag called quick alert. The dash there is very important because that signifies to the browser that we're making a custom element. And with that, I've actually got my own like tag, right? Yay, that's pretty cool. 
Uh, but it doesn't really do that much. It's basically a span. So I've created this like generic container thing. So if I want to give it a little bit of UI, a little bit of look and feel, I'm going to add this other element to my HTML file. I'm going to drop in a DOM module. And DOM module, if you're familiar with previous versions of Polymer, you can think of it kind of like the old Polymer element. It's basically the place where you put all the templating for your element. So inside of DOM module, uh, I want to make sure to give it a template tag. I also want to make sure to give it an ID that matches my tag name. Because when we take all these things, we concatenate all of our components together into one bundle file, uh, Polymer is going to use that ID plus your element name to kind of link these two up. Now, anything I put inside of that template, that's what's going to render on page when someone uses an instance of my tag. And we refer to all that content as your element's local DOM. Now, some of you might be familiar with the term shadow DOM, right? Uh, local DOM, you can think of it as basically the same thing. It is all of the, the internal encapsulated private markup that your element is in charge of creating and managing for itself. In previous versions of Polymer, we always referred to this as shadow DOM. In Polymer 1.0, uh, we stopped using the shadow DOM polyfill, and we started using our own much lighter weight uh, shim, which we call shady DOM. And because we had these two terms floating around, shady DOM and shadow DOM, we just combined them and we just call it local DOM, OK? So anytime I say local DOM, you can think of it as, as all the encapsulated bits inside your component. So to give my component a little bit of local DOM, inside of its template, I'm just going to drop in a div tag. And I'm going to give it an alert class and some text. And I can drop in a style element. I can style that alert class. And that style is only going to take effect inside of, of my component. That style is not going to leak out and affect anything else in the document. So with that in place, someone can actually use my little tag and they'll end up with this green alert banner. But the problem now is that the text itself is hard-coded, right? And so no one's going to actually want to use this thing in their application. So what I'd like to do is replace that hard-coded text with some content which I invite in from the light DOM. So we say that the light DOM is the world outside of your component. And what I want to do is allow the user to pass some content through the light DOM and have it render as if it were inside my component's local DOM. And this is actually really easy to do. I just replace the alert text with a content element. And now anything that someone passes into my quick alert element, any message that they pass in, or even markup, they could write HTML inside of there, that will render as if it were inside of my local DOM. And now they get their message displaying on screen. So at this point, I have this component. And what's really cool about it is that it's universal. I can take this component and I can drop it into uh, other applications. I can drop it into things that are using Angular or Ember or Backbone or what have you. I've made a, a little universal widget, which is really nice. I'm not locked in with this thing. So I like the way that it looks. The next thing I want to do is give it a bit of behavior. And in previous versions of Polymer, to give your element like properties and things like that was actually a little tricky. There were a couple different ways of doing it. In Polymer 1.0, we've just unified this into a single properties object to make it a lot easier for you. And the properties object is pretty powerful, so I want to walk you through some of the neat things that you can do with it. First and foremost, uh, I've got this little name tag thing that I'm creating here, and you can see that I've given it two properties, first and last, uh, as if someone's passing in like a first and last name. And I've typed both of these to string. And what's going to happen in Polymer is, as someone passes in values via attributes to this component, they will be deserialized to those types. So you can use all sorts of different types, string, object, array, number. Here's an example of using a number for an age property and also giving it a default value. You can also create observer functions that run on your elements prototype anytime this property is changed. So if someone changes the value of age to be a JavaScript or via an attribute, this age change function is going to run. And you can also have your components dispatch events automatically when their properties change. And the nice thing about this is this is the way that native DOM elements work. Right? When you've got an input tag on your page and you're just like typing in there, it's firing change events. So it's the same thing here. Anytime anyone's changing my age property, it's just going to be firing events automatically. But the other thing about this notify true attribute is that it's also the basis for our two-way data binding system in Polymer. So in Polymer 1.0, data bindings flow one way. If you want, if you want a property to be two-way bindable, you add this notify flag here. The other thing is that we hope that this makes it easier for us to interoperate with other data binding systems. So if you have some other library or framework that you're using that does two-way data binding, it can listen for these automatic change events to know that it needs to update its binding. 
Uh, the last thing you can do, which is really neat, are computed properties. So if I want to compute first and last name together into a full name property, I just write out a little function here, and I'm actually doing it as a string. So that's the name of a function on my prototype that I want to run any time either first or last changes and recompute those values. The reason it's a string is because Polymer is going to take this and actually break the string apart, look at those two arguments, and then find the properties that it needs to observe. So it's a really convenient way to set up sort of observable properties. Now to give you a practical example of this, taking that alert banner, I'm going to just give it a shown property so we can toggle its visible state on or off. And in my quick alert prototype, I've just got inside of the properties object, I've got a shown property, which is a Boolean. It defaults to false, so by default this thing is gonna be hidden, and it's 2A data bindable. Now to actually leverage this in my elements template, I'm just going to create a binding for the hidden attribute that just HTML elements get for free and bind to the state of shown. So as shown is being toggled, hidden will toggle on or off. So what this means is someone can take my quick alert element and I can combine it with like a Polymer paper checkbox, which are our like material design elements. And if they are inside of a Polymer application, they could link the state of these two things using a data binding, creating a little scope variable there. If they're inside of an Angular 2 application, they could do the same thing, instead passing in the value for is signed up via their component controller. In either case, we'll end up with this really nice little uh, linkage where as you're toggling the checkbox, the shown property of the banner is going on or off. So that's pretty cool. Uh, the last thing I wanna talk about regarding building elements is styling and theming, because this is something that in previous versions of Polymer and working with the Shadow DOM was just really difficult. And a lot of developers who were excited about Shadow DOM initially got to that point and they were kind of like, mm, I feel like I'm not quite getting what was promised here. Uh, so as I mentioned before, in previous versions of Polymer, if you wanted to reach in and style a component, you had to use these funky, weird, shadow-piercing selectors. Um, and really, they were, they were pretty inefficient. They were also kind of like sledgehammers. Like, they just weren't very accurate and kind of gross. They sort of ruined the encapsulation. So for Polymer 1.0, we started working on a brand new system that leverages CSS custom properties. And if you haven't heard of CSS custom properties before, you can think of them like really flexible variables. So I'm sure many of you have worked with SAS or LESS or Stylus, something like that before. All those CSS preprocessors have this notion of variables. Custom properties are variables, but the big difference is that they're standards track. So custom properties are CSS variables basically that are already shipping in Firefox and they're being worked on in Chrome. So what we did was we actually just built our whole theming system around custom properties. So if I want to change the background color of this quick alert element, which right now is hard coded to green, I can do that using this custom property syntax. Now I realize that this looks kind of funky, but the main point that I really want to stress here is that this is native CSS variables in the browser. This is standards track, okay? So yes, it does look funky, but that's what standards body agreed upon and and at least you don't have to use a preprocessor to use it. So the actual custom property is that little bit of text there with the two dashes. So when I say dash, dash, quick alert, background, I'm basically exposing a hook to the outside world to pass in a style. And the little var parentheses syntax is how I actually extract the value out of the custom property and use it. It's basically how you just execute the variable. So with this one thing here, I've, I've exposed the outside world a way for them to pass in a style without them actually knowing about the internals of my component. And if I want to add a default value, I can do that pretty easily, right? And still have it default to green if they didn't supply a value. And for someone to actually target this thing, they're gonna to need to use a fancy little element that we created called custom style. So as I mentioned, CSS custom properties are shipping in Firefox, but they're not shipping in other browsers yet. So with this custom style element here, we've actually shim support for custom properties in all the different browsers. So you can add your styles to custom style. So here I'm targeting quick alert. I'm targeting that quick alert background custom property that I've exposed. And I can pass in my own color value to this component. So now we get an orange banner instead of a green one. Now that's cool, but if you had to define essentially a variable for every single property in your component for people to style, that would be sort of time consuming and really suck. So the other thing that we've been working on is using, or extending, I should say, custom properties to work like mixins. So I'm sure many of you who've worked with SAS or less before are familiar with mixins. They basically let you pass in a whole bag of CSS all at once. So using this interesting at sign apply syntax, 
Now I'm no longer leveraging a single custom property. I'm actually creating a point for a mixin. So my, my custom property is still called quick alert theme, but it's being treated like a mixin. And in my custom style, I can target the quick alert element. I can target the quick alert theme, that, that mixin, and I can pass in as much CSS as I want to theme this component. And so now, when someone clicks on this thing, it's radically different. But the, all the internals, all the markup, everything, all the bones inside of that component remain the same. It's just much easier to theme. And the cool thing about this is that as an author, I have like really, really fine grained control over how theming is applied. I could supply individual variables. I could supply mixins. I could mix and match that stuff. So it's a really, really awesome solution to the problem of theming Shadow DOM. Okay, up to this point, I've basically just been talking about building my own element. But you know, the beauty of web components is that I don't have to build everything myself. The beauty of web components is that I can reuse things that other people have built. So when I want to add some new feature to my application, rather than rolling it all myself, I can just say, there's an element for that. I can go find something in a catalog, bring that into my app. So on the Polymer team, along with writing the core library, we've also been working on element sets, which we call product lines. And many of you may be familiar with the core and the paper elements that the Polymer team has produced in the past. With Polymer 1.0, we've actually updated these sets. So the core elements have been renamed to iron elements. These provide sort of the basic building blocks for your application. And the paper elements are our implementation of material design for the web. But there are some other sets that I really want to highlight here. The first are the Google web components. So Google has over 250 APIs, which is bonkers. Um, but there is an API for like everything you could possibly imagine, maps, uh, sheets, YouTube, Hangouts, Chromecast, like you name it, there is probably an API for it. Um, and these APIs are amazing, right? These services are super powerful, but they can be difficult to set up sometimes, right? So what we want to do is try to create kind of like an SDK of Google APIs all surfaced as elements. So that way, if you need to work with maps or sheets or YouTube or something like that, then there's an element for that. And with these elements acting as the common interface, it becomes dramatically easier to leverage these services in your application. So that's the Google Web Components, but that's only one of the sets that we've been working on. The other one that we've been doing is called Platinum Elements. Now, right now, there are a whole host of new features which are landing in the browser, things like push notification and offline storage and sync. A lot of stuff that was previously only available to native apps are now coming to the web. Now, these are amazing APIs, but they're, again, they're, they're sort of low level, which means there can be a bit of a learning curve. So with the Platinum Elements, what we've done is we've just rolled these APIs into really easy to use tags. So if you want to drop a push notification manager into your application, uh, you can just do that with a single element. If you want to enable offline caching and syncing, you can do that with a single tag. And again, these are things that like previously we've only dreamed about, and now it's as simple as a single element. So that's the platinum elements. I'm actually going to talk more about those a little bit later. Uh, the last thing that I want to show you are the gold elements. So gold elements are specifically targeted at e-commerce and making sure that checkout flows are as smooth as possible, especially on mobile. Some recent statistics that I found showed that 85% of US retailers' mobile traffic actually comes through the mobile web. And about 90% of, of their revenue for the, through mobile traffic actually comes through the mobile web which means that this is a huge area for us to just totally crush it. Um, with the gold elements, you're going to get auto-validating credit card fields, email fields, phone numbers, uh, again, all optimized for mobile devices and all marked up with autocomplete attributes. So the other thing that we found is that when you correctly mark up a form using autocomplete, that users typically finish filling out that form about 30% faster. So again, it's a really, really important area for us to get right on the web. And as with all our product lines, we expect this set to continue to grow as we tackle more of the problems in the e-commerce space. But already, like, I'm really excited to see what people start building with these. OK, so those are the element product lines that we're shipping today. If you want to browse the entire collection, you can go to elements.polymerproject.org. Uh, that is actually going to take you to this catalog. And the catalog lets you do a bunch of cool things. You can just search up there. We have a little search field. You can search for elements by product line or by tag. So maybe if you're just looking for inspiration, uh, you can browse through the elements, read their documentation, check out their demos. And the one cool feature is that you can actually add them to a collection. 
And that will give you this little notification here. So as you're going around, you find elements that you like, you add them to your collection. And then when you're ready to like, check out, if you will, you can go click on this button in the top right, and you can download all of your elements and their dependencies as either a zip bundle or a Bower JSON file that you can just check into your source control so you and all of your teammates can, can collaborate that way. So again, our hope with all of this is that when you have some problem that you're trying to solve or some feature that you want to add to your application, that you can say that there's an element for that. And speaking of applications, this is actually one of the areas where I still get a lot of questions from developers. They are excited about web components, or they think Polymer is really, really neat, and they get how to build individual elements, but they're just not sure how to knit things together into an entire app. And so to help with this, we've also got another project that we've been working on called Polymer Starter Kit. And Polymer Starter Kit is an opinionated scaffold for building Polymer 1.0 apps, especially apps that look great across multiple devices. So what do you get out of the box? Well, first and foremost, you get application templates, which is really good because I am a terrible designer, and I love when like, I have a template to work from, and I don't have to just stare at some blank page. So we've got templates for navigation cards, uh, list details for building things like contact lists or feeds, uh, as well as wider card views for situations where you really want to have like, a bunch of bold visual content. And these are only a subset of the uh, layouts that we are shipping and working on. We're going to try to keep growing this set, and we are working with the material design team to build these. Uh, so the other thing that we've been including in these are responsive breakpoints. So responsive design is crucial for building multi-device applications, and recently the material design specification was updated with guidance for responsive breakpoints. So all these are just baked into Starter Kit. You don't have to set these up yourself. They're just going to come baked in for free. Uh, these are best guess breakpoints by the material design team, but it's always important to make sure that when you're building your own application that you try it on different device sizes, you resize it and everything, and where it looks funky, you add your own breakpoint or you modify the existing breakpoints. And Starter Kit makes this very easy for you by including them all in a simple theme file. And speaking of theming, the other thing that I showed you earlier, right, was, was working with custom properties to theme a single element. Starter Kit just like dials that up to 11. So we've got full support for custom properties in all of the layouts. So you change these colors, it's gonna update the layout. The other cool thing is that all of Polymer's paper material design elements also use these same custom properties. So if you change these values, not only is the layout gonna change, but any of the material design elements that you're using in that application will also update as well to match these colors, which is pretty cool. The other thing we're working on is making sure that your users get the most engaging mobile experience that they possibly can. So we've added support for things like meta theme color and also web app install banners. And so that way, as your user is engaging with your application over time, the browser is actually going to prompt them to see if they want to add it to their home screen. And once they do add it to their home screen, Starter Kit provides really good icon defaults for cross-device icons. So whether you're on Android or iOS or Windows Phone, uh, we have icons for you, and they're already set up inside the template to install properly, so you can just go in and put your own branding in there. <clears throat> the other thing I want to touch on is the offline capabilities of Starter Kit, because if you're building a mobile application these days and it's not working offline, then it's not really a mobile experience. If your user is going into like a tunnel or a train or on the bus and they're losing connectivity, then they're not really getting that sort of mobile experience on your app. So with Starter Kit, I'm pleased to say that we have offline first support. So you can go in, you can just set the thing to airplane mode, and the whole application is gonna to continue to work offline. You can go, you can reload it, you can check out the different pages, you can click on the different routes, and everything is going to continue to work offline. Um, we are doing this by adding support for Service Worker. And Service Worker is an amazing technology. It's one of those technologies that's used in the Platinum set. Uh, it's very powerful, it's also very low level, and normally you have to write a ton of JavaScript to make Service Worker work. I shouldn't say a ton, because my, my coworkers work on that. You have to write a fair bit of JavaScript to make Service Worker work. Um, because it's powerful, right? It lets you handle all sorts of things. Pro proxy network requests, um, deal with caching, uh, pulling things out of the cache and re returning them. So there's a lot of cool stuff you can do there. Thankfully, instead of having to write this yourself, there's an element for that. So using elements from the Platinum set, we're able to add Service Worker support in a single tag to the starter kit. It actually looks like this right here. So that platinum service worker cache element is what's doing our heavy lifting. 
And you can see that it's very easy to configure. We can change the default caching strategy from network first uh, over to cache first. So if a network's available, it'll go network first or return from the cache. If it's cache first, it'll go from the cache first. Uh, you can also tell it to pre-cache assets. So if there are some things that you know a user of your application is going to need when they go offline, but maybe they haven't visited that, that thing yet and it hasn't had a chance to dynamically cache it, you can specifically tell this element to pre-cache those, those assets. And if you don't want to do it all in markup like that, because uh, that could be cumbersome, you can also have a path to a JSON file where you have all your paths that you want to pre-cache there, which is pretty nice. Another thing you may want to add are notifications, right? So a user gets a, a native notification, and they can click on it and jump back and re-engage with your application. This is another thing that is enabled by Service Worker. And I'm happy to say that there is an element for that too. So using the Platinum push messaging element with basically a little bit of HTML, you can instantly add push messaging support to your application, which is really neat. And this is all detailed more if you go check out the Starter Kit website. Uh, the next thing I wanna talk about is how you productionize this thing. So you've got it looking and behaving and doing all the stuff that you want. How do you actually like, compact it down to the smallest thing possible so you can deliver a fast experience to your users? So for Starter Kit, we wanna help out here, and so we're big fans of Gulp. So we've gone ahead and just built a whole Gulp build process for you that ships with the starter kit. Uh, so out of the box, you're gonna get support for testing your components using Web Component Tester, uh, code quality using JS Hint and JSCS, uh, also support for Vulcanize, which is our tool to concatenate and minify all of your components and make them as tiny as possible. You're also gonna get support for Browser Sync, and Browser Sync is a really wonderful library uh, when you're developing, what it does is it takes any page that is looking at your current URL and it live reloads it as you're changing things in your editor. The nice thing is that it also synchronizes clicks and scrolls. So if you're scrolling around on your desktop, then your phone is gonna scroll. Clicking around on your desktop, your tablet will click. Matches what you're doing. So it makes it very, very nice to develop. So uh, if you're interested in Polymer Starter Kit, you can download that at developers.google.com. Uh, but I know probably a lot of you in the audience are thinking, like, can I combine Polymer Starter Kit with Angular 2, right? And this is sort of the, the, the beauty of web components is that we could take all these different things and combine them together. So what I did was I went on sort of a safari, if you will, and uh, I did some experiments here. And I, I can say that you know, some of this works. There's still some rough edges. Um, I will give you this warning, though. Uh, I am not an Angular 2 developer. And I really recommend that you don't launch any of what I'm about to show you into production, because Angular 2 is still very alpha. There's a lot to work on. But I wanted to show you this because I think it's really, really neat. OK. So if you actually want to go try this at home, you want to grab Angular and get Polymer 1.0 working at the same time, uh, the first thing that you really got to be mindful of is this tiny little pull request that I had to submit uh, to the Zone.js project. It's like the world's smallest change. It's like a one-liner. Uh, but, but presently, the two will explode. There's like a runtime error that occurs if you include Polymer and Angular on the same page. But this is like the world's tiniest, tiniest PR. Uh, so go check out this change. Make sure that you add this to your AngularJS file. It's literally an if. It's like the smallest thing ever. Go add it to your, your AngularJS file. And then the two can exist on the same page. And then you want to go and download Polymer Starter Kit. So you just go to developers.google.com and download the Starter Kit zip. And when you open that, this is what you're going to see in the index file. There's quite a lot of code in the head tag of the index file. Uh, all these meta tags here, uh, this, is add to, this is to add support for things like meta theme color on Chrome for Android, uh, web app manifests, those cross device icons that I was showing before, right? So this is all the stuff basically that makes your app play nice offline. And you pretty much want to just leave all that there. Uh, the thing that I, I did need to add was the little bit of boilerplate to get Angular up and running. Um, and I just took this literally like right from the Angular getting started guide. So there's probably even fancier ways to do this. Um, but with this in place, I think I'm, I'm kind of at a point where I'm ready to start tackling having Angular drive my layout. And so to do that, there's a few steps that we got to go through. Inside the index file, we have this special template called um, DOM bind, which is, which is a Polymer thing that lets us do data binding in a particular spot in Polymer. But I want Angular to be driving this whole thing. So what you're going to want to do is actually just delete this element. Just, you'll just have an empty body tag. But you will take all the stuff that is inside the template. You're going to take that with you. And you're going to place it inside of your own Angular component. So I just made a very simple MyApp TypeScript file. And 
The, probably the only unique thing about it is that I'm using a template URL to point at an external HTML file because I have quite a lot of markup that I want to paste in there. And then I just dropped in all of the markup that had been previously in the body tag of my index file for my layout. I just dropped it right into that component. So this is kind of like the root of my application. Uh, the next thing I got to do is a little bit of house cleaning. So I'm going to go through this template, and there are places where I need to remove a few things. So I want to remove any of the data bindings that Polymer was previously using. So just clear those out, because we're going to replace those with Angular bindings. I want to remove the event handlers that Polymer is using. So Polymer uses on dash syntax for its event handlers. We're going to replace those with Angular. Uh, and then I want to update the routes. So any place where you see selected equals route, you would change that to like square bracket selected equals route. And then there's a routes HTML file, which just has a few routes in JavaScript. So I would paste those into my controller as well, or my component as well, I should say. And with that, you can actually go over to your terminal. You can run gulp serve. It will do its thing. And it will boot up automatically for you. And now you've got Angular running this Polymer app. And you can go, you can click on the routes, and everything continues to work, which is really cool. <clears throat> So the next thing you're going to want to do is add your own components to this. And this is where things get a little thorny, a little hairy, and there's maybe some rough edges to work out. So what I wanted to do was add a little to-do list Angular component that I created. So I made an Angular 2 to-do list that looked just like that. And I dropped it inside of my application. And instead of rendering inside of the main layout, it just like appeared over here where the menu used to be. It's like, what? What's going on? Um, and it, What's happening here is that, if you remember, I talked about this concept of local DOM before. So you have both Angular and Polymer trying to emulate Shadow DOM for you. And they're trying to figure out how to do content distribution inside of this app. And they're just like, well, who, who exactly gets to handle that? And I think what's going on here is that you know, somewhere the bookkeeping is just getting messed up. So one solution that I came up with was to actually Instead of using Web Components Lite.js, which is our little lightweight bundle of polyfills, was to revert back to using Web Components JS, which includes the Shadow DOM polyfill, and then telling Polymer, like forcing Polymer to use Shadow DOM versus using its Shady DOM system. And this actually does fix things in Chrome, but we still have issues in Firefox and Safari. And so as far as adding components, this is kind of where I ran into a stumbling block. Now, I know that Angular also has built into it, hidden away in there, is this thing called native shadow DOM strategy, which I tried to add to my application, but it, it seemed to trigger some runtime errors. So it may be that there's some bugs there that we just need to work out. Another option that we've been discussing on my team is perhaps building shady DOM adapters, building these little things that will teach Angular about how to play nice with Polymer's uh, shady DOM system while we still exist in this world uh, in between where we're all sort of simulating shadow DOM. But the real solution to this is just for all the browsers to ship Shadow DOM. And once Shadow DOM is native everywhere, this will actually just magically work. No one will have to emulate the way that content gets distributed in the Shadow DOM. They can just use it. So anyway, that was sort of a stumbling block that I ran into there. But there's more cool stuff that we can actually do. We can, we can keep going, and there's, there's some interesting things that we can do here. So the next thing I wanted to do was listen for events coming out of elements. Because not all of the elements out there do content distribution. Right? You, don't, you don't always have to do that using Polymer Elements. We have some interesting elements out there that do things like offline caching. So this Platinum Service Worker element, uh, I wanted to use it just to cache my application. And it does not display any UI. It does not need to distribute anything anywhere. So in theory, I should be able to continue to use this in my Angular 2 app. And now the one thing it does do is it dispatches events. And there's an event that it fires that I wanted to listen for that basically tells us when the service worker has begun caching or has actually finished caching. Uh, and we can use that to then display like a little toast notification to let the user know that the app is available offline. So originally, I was like, all right, cool. I have read enough of the Angular Getting Started Guide to know that this is how you add an event listener in Angular 2. Uh, but what I found here was that if I do a dash cased event name like that, and currently in Angular 2, dash case events are going to get converted to camel cased. And, and there may be an easy workaround for this. I'm not sure if there is. Uh, but I, I did find you know, down in the dev tools that it converted the event name over to service worker installed, which is actually not the event that it fires. 
So I had a bit of a dilemma here where I was like, mm, I'm not really sure what the best thing to do is. And then like, someone next to me was like, just add event listener. I was like, oh yeah, I could just add event listener. Um, so inside of my component, I pass in element ref, which is an Angular 2 class that'll let you get access to the DOM for your component. And if you target element ref dot DOM element, that'll actually give you the actual DOM node. And from there, it's really easy. I can just use query selector to query selector for that platinum service worker element that's inside of my application. I can query selector for the little toast element that I'm going to uh, have show up in response to that event. And then I can just use vanilla add event listener to listen for the event coming out of my service worker. And the nice thing about this is I get this notification now, the toast pops up, and the Angular 2 app is actually running offline. And you can verify this. You can go and uh, turn on mobile emulation in the DevTools, zoom in here and look at that little network dropdown. <clears throat> and I can actually set the network. You can throttle the network using this dropdown. So I set it to offline. And then I can reload this application. And it's continuing to work. I can still open up the sidebar. I can still click through all the different routes. And I can still access all the content that's in there. So I've got an Angular 2 app that I have just offlined entirely using a Polymer element without actually having to write really that much JavaScript, which is pretty cool. OK, so that is about as far as I got with Angular 2. Uh, I want to maybe do an update on this talk in the future, because I want to keep working on this. Uh, in particular, there's some folks on the Polymer team that I'm going to try to work with to maybe build some of these adapter things to see if that'll work. Uh, but we covered a lot today. Um, and the main takeaway that I want to give you all is that Polymer itself is lean, mean, and production ready. Right? We're ready for people to actually start building Polymer apps out there in the wild. If you're using Polymer Starter Kit, you're going to get a ton of really cool things out of the box. Uh, you're going to get components for like, nearly any situation. You're going to get a complete build process using Gulp to help you productionize your application. You're going to get some really nice app theming using custom properties and the Polymer paper elements. Uh, you'll get responsive layouts and routing, and basically a material design scaffold that is just ready for your own content. So a uh, bit of a shameless plug, I run this show uh, on YouTube every two weeks called Polycasts. So you can find it at bit.ly slash polycast. Uh, I talk about Polymer, talk about just using web components in general, and I really, really, really want to talk about using Polymer with Angular 2. So you can check out that URL, you can check out the show, and you know, as, as I learn more about this interop, I will, I will definitely do some episodes on that. Uh, the other thing is that we're doing a summit September 15th in Amsterdam on the water at this like, really beautiful venue. So if you're interested in Polymer, um, you know, maybe we can do an update to this talk there. I'm not sure if we'll, we'll have everything sorted out by then. But uh, definitely, if you're interested in Polymer and you can travel, come see us in Amsterdam. We'll talk more about service worker, offline stuff, a lot of really cool things there. Uh, and if you're interested, just in general, polymerproject.org is the place to find all the stuff that I was talking about today, demo documentation, the catalog, the starter kit, everything is there. Uh, so thank you all so much for having me here today. It's been really, really awesome speaking with you. I can't wait to see what you all build. So I'll go componentize the web. Thanks.